Good morning, uh, buenos dias. Thank you all for coming to my talk uh, today. Uh, before I begin my presentation, I'd like to express my gratitude uh, to the many people who have contributed to this project. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I stand today on the traditional homelands of the Tigua, and I present this work with respect to all the indigenous people who are the tradi traditional guardians of this land, and with respect to the enduring relationships that exist between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories for many generations in the past, the present, and the future. I would also like to thank my family and friends and advisors for their support during the process of researching this project and writing my dissertation. In particular, I'd like to thank Ramon Gutierrez, an alum of the University of New Mexico and a current professor of American history at the University of Chicago, whose guidance and constructive criticism has been critical to the development of my research and writing. Most of all, I would like to thank the Center for Regional Studies for the intellectual and financial support that I received as a visiting scholar this semester. Conversations with Professor Melendez here on campus and during visits to sites outside of Albuquerque were especially important for me for the formulation of research questions, the identification of sources, and the creative inspiration that made this work possible. Special thanks are also due to Alicia Fitzgerald for her assistance in navigating the university's administrative bureaucracy <laughs> and for helping me find a good place to get a green chili cheeseburger on campus. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank the director, archivists, and staff at the Center for uh, Southwest Research for their knowledge, professionalism, and good cheer that invigorated my historical research and warmed my heart. My book manuscript, Mapping the Apacharia, American Indian Sovereignty and State Power in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands, examines one of the more sustained interactions between European and Native empires in North America. This work traces the history of Spanish, Mexican, and U.S. relations with the Ap Apache and their peoples in the geographical expanse known as the Apacharia. This was a vast region that spanned the present-day states of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas in the United States, as well as the Mexican states of Sonora, Chihuahua, and Coahuila. As distant relatives of the people who migrated from Western Canada to the Colorado Plateau and the Central Plains in the 14th and 15th centuries, then they were relative newcomers to the dominion claimed by Spain in 1598 as the Kingdom of New Mexico. The dispersed tribal units of bands and clans developed an extensive trading network connecting the hunters and gatherers of the plains with the primarily horticultural societies of the upper Rio Grande Valley. When Spanish efforts to colonize the Pueblo Indians of New Mexico faltered in the 17th century, then they came to occupy an increasingly prominent <coughs> position in the periphery of colonial society. As a result, Spanish officials implemented a series of new policies intended to reduce their mobility and that of other nomadic populations in the frontiers of New Spain. The Bourbon regime under King Charles III, in particular, attempted to apply, apply enlightened principles of scientific organization to restrict their movement by placing them on early reservations. However, with the collapse of Spain's North American Empire in 1821, the Ende gained new footholds in the region and advanced farther south, reaching the populous mining centers in Durango and Zacatecas. Even after the creation of the international boundary at the end of the U.S. war with Mexico in 1848, the civil and military officials in Mexico and the United States struggled to assert political and territorial sovereignty in regions that were controlled by the Inde and other powerful indigenous societies. I hope this research will contribute to the growing body of interdisciplinary scholarship on the history of indigenous and mixed race people living in the region known today as the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Previous generations of scholars construed the so-called Spanish borderlands as small, isolated patches of territory in North America that were nominally under the jurisdiction of the Spanish monarchy. While there are notable exceptions, the old school of Spanish borderland studies minimized the role of indigenous and mixed race populations, casting European colonists as central pro protagonists in heroic and celebratory narratives of exploration, conquest, and nation building. Recent research on the region has shifted the analytical focus and expanded the geographical and temporal scope of the field to include a broader range of historical actors. The new historical scholarship is more interdisciplinary in its approach and transnational in its breadth. Building on the insights of Matthew Bab Babcock, Juliana Barr, Jennifer Dennett Dale, Argo Tamez, Veronica Velarde Tiller, and Cuauhtémoc Velasco Avila, my work draws from extensive research in Spanish, Mexican, and U.S. archives to show how the Ende became entangled in the conflicts 
over territory, property, citizenship, and racial identities that divided communities in the borderlands. <clears throat> the history of the Southern Athapaskan diaspora offers new perspectives on critical issues relating to the social history of New Mexico, including the formation of regional identities and communities, the development of the region's Indo-Hispano heritage, the succession of property regimes relating to land grants, rural villages and rancherias, and the control of natural resources. Moreover, the history of the Southern Athapaskan diaspora and the formation of Apache identities provides opportunities to make interregional connections between different environments and ecosystems, between different Native American homelands and tribal territories, and between different traditions and political systems that transcend the geographical and conceptual boundaries delimiting the region's social history. By looking at the deep history of Native American intellectual traditions, the material reality of the built environment, and the struggle for autonomy and self-determination, scholars of the Southwest can develop new understandings of the people, ideas, events, and historical processes that shaped our present reality and those that continue to inform our vision of the future. <clears throat> During the past several months, I've read, analyzed, and analyzed available indigenous oral traditions in the Percy Digmouth Collection and the American Indian Oral History Collection at the Center for Southwest Research. I also examined a wide range of archival sources relating to Apache history and culture in the Spanish archives of New Mexico, documents from the Archivo General de Indias in Seville, Spain, and the Archivo General de la Nación in Mexico City that are held here at the Center for Southwest Research. While my book project as a whole also examines these themes during the early 19th century under the Mexican administration up to 1848, and under the U.S. administration of the territories of New Mexico after that period, the focus of my archival research during the past several months was the colonial archives of New Mexico. The focus of my research was the reconstruction of Apache migration, the development of trading and raiding networks, their relations with other native peoples in the Southern Plains and the greater Southwest, and the emergence of distinct ethnic and tribal identities in the 18th century. Archaeological, linguistic, and oral evidence has established a relationship between the northern Athapascan, the Pacific Coast Athapascans, and the southern Athapascan speaking groups, which include the Navajo and the Apache. The Athapascan groups were united in West Central Canada until approximately 1300 AD, and for reasons unknown began, began to disperse at that time. Some of the groups remained in Canada, others migrated to Alaska, and so others began to move south and eventually settled along the Pacific coast and in the southwestern United States. Today there are several subgroups of Athapascan languages, which include 23 Athapascan languages in western Canada and interior Alaska, eight Pacific coast related languages, the Navajo language, and six Apachean languages. The Apache languages are divided into two major groups, the Kiowa Apache and the Southwestern Apache. This latter Apache group has been further divided into sub two subgroups, the Hikaria and the Lepan. And secondly, the Mescalero, Chiricahua, and Western Apache. The Northern Athapascans may have had some access to the seacoast, but their subsistence was prim primarily inland, utilizing caribou as well as salmon. At certain fixed locales, rich food sources were av available in the region on a seasonal basis. However, the overall sparseness of the subarctic food supply, the se seasonality, and the mobility of large game made it necessary for resident hunters to move a great deal in order to take advantage of the scattered resources. This mobility encouraged a tendency to follow the food sources and may have contributed to a social strategy that enhanced small group and individual autonomy flexibility and movement. <clears throat> In addition, it possibly opened the way for the spread of the Athapascan population throughout the subarctic, <clears throat> stretching from the Alaskan interior southeastward toward the Rockies, thus allowing the Athapascan groups to remain in roughly the same ecological setting as they move south. <clears throat> since, the Apache hunters were, uh, since the Apache were hunters and gatherers, very little archaeological evidence of events exists that would provide clues about the routes taken into the south. There are, however, two major theories. The first theory suggests the Apache moved from the west central Canada and took a western route 
through the Colorado or Utah, and then down into the southwest. So this is the route illustrated on the far left of the map. Um, evidence for this route was taken from archaeological evidence in these areas, which found circular stone structures that had doors facing east, a characteristic of Athapascan structures and remains of pointed bottom pottery, which is a Navajo style. This area was also similar in terrain to the northern areas inhabited by the Athapascans. The second theory suggests that the Carecheros, the Tellas, and the Vaqueros, whom the Spanish encountered in this area, were actually Apache. This would suggest that the Apache migrated through the northwest and then came down through the central plains. So this is a, a different migration route that you see on the illustration on the left um, that goes through the Great Plains. Native American groups borrowed cultural practices from one another, and they came into contact um, uh, with, with uh, the Plains Buffalo culture um, during this period. Although it is difficult to piece together evidence, uh, although it is difficult to piece together from existing evidence, Apache groups arrived in the Southwest between 1400 and 1525, according to linguistic similarities, Apache oral history, and archaeological evidence. It is challenging to put together the history of this period for several reasons. First, the Spanish were the first non-natives to arrive in the Southwest to use the name Apache to designate both Southern Athapascan groups and non-related groups. This makes it difficult to determine if the written accounts of this period describe the practice of the Apache or other Native American groups. Second, the Southern Athapascan groups were loosely organized into small kinship groups at the time of arrival. These smaller kinship groups allied with each other to form larger groups or bands when a small group could not accomplish a task on its own, as such during times of war. But there was no collective Apache identity between these groups. Each smaller group designated itself by a word meaning the people, such as a day. The term Apache was first used to describe several different cultural units in the Southwest by Juan de Oñate in 1598. The word may have come from the uh, Zuni word for Navajo or the Yavapai word for people. Whatever the case, a collective Apache identity came only at a much later historical period. The lifestyle of some Apache groups shifted from nomadic hunting and gathering to that of hunting and farming after arrival in the Southwest. Previously, groups had, had to follow game from one territory to another in a seasonal cycle, but the introduction of farming made a more sedentary lifestyle possible. This led some groups to establish permanent Pueblo villages with adobe houses, brush structures, or teepees, since they were no longer primarily dependent on game as a food source. <clears throat> According to the Mescalero Apache story of creation, the first human was a woman named Esanaklesh. Upon emerging from the primordial waters, her parents decided she should have a female initiation ceremony and was therefore, therefore the first woman to participate in the ceremony that teaches all young women to appreciate the spiritual and cultural values of their people. According to the Mescalero Apache scholar of religious studies, Ines Talamantes, quote, the girls are taught tribal history. They are given the knowledge of plants, animals, minerals, mountains, and landscapes. They are taught about the earth, the place below the earth, and the place above the earth, end quote. During the female initiation ceremony, they are also taught to recognize that they are now living in the space between the earth and the sky. According to the Mescalero Apache vision of the cosmos, at the time that Esanaklesh emerged from the primordial waters and began to learn about the spiritual and cultural power, spiritual and cultural powers of the universe, the earth already existed and was in a process of continual change, which was and continues to be seen as the manifestations of the cyclical powers of nature. This vision of the cosmos and of, the, as na and of nature as a dynamic life source is central to the myths and the stories that the ancestors of the Mescalero Apache told for many generations about the earth, the flora, the fauna, the sun, the sky, the moon, and the stars. However, this understanding of the natural world involved more than just information acquired by the senses. As Asanaklesh learned, and as all young Mescalero Apache women learn through the female initiation ceremony, there is a spiritual dimension to existence. In addition to the natural world that one can see, smell, touch, hear, or taste, within every entity in existence, 
there was also an internal form of elemental power understood as Diye. According to Talamantas, this power is responsible for objects being alive or having, uh, or having life, and it is the supernatural force that allows ritual transformation to occur, to occur through people engaged in ceremonial activities. The cultural anthropologist Keith Basso came to understand the significance of this concept of power through his work with the White Mountain and Sibiqui bands of the Western Apache in Arizona. Basso wrote, quote, the term die, or power, refers to one or all of a set of abstract and invisible forces which are said to derive from certain classes of animals, plants, minerals, meteorological phenomena, and mythological figures within the Western Apache universe. According to the Western Apache, there is an inexhaustible supply of each type of this power in the universe. Only a small percentage of it can be acquired by man and brought under his control, but, uh, but the remainder stays free to act on its own. This latter portion does not possess moral sanctity, nor is it considered by the Western Apache to be inherently benevolent. To the contrary, if a power is offered by what is considered, if a power is offended by what is considered disrespectful behavior, it is capable of causing extreme hardship. End quote. So again, this is Basso's description of the Apache conception of Diye, or power, that he acquired through ethnological study with the Western Apache. In other words, the Western Apache vision of the cosmos acknowledges the physical and metaphysical attributes of the universe without attributing moral or normative arguments about the human standing in the world relative to other sentient beings or physical entities. Events that may befall an individual, such as sickness, death, bad luck, or strained social relations are considered coincidental or contingent rather than being ordained by a holy deity or an abstract theory of causality. Although this cosmovision has been dismissed simply as anim animism, that is, the attribution of souls to plants, animals, and inanimate objects, the concept of the Ye as a universal source of power has significant social and cultural implications, especially in light of the arrival and the historical development of the Southern Athapascan diaspora and the years before Spanish contact. <clears throat> the historical processes that propelled the Southern Athapasca migration into the Southwest were tied to the emergence of what Timothy G. Baugh has described as the Southern Plains macroeconomy, which developed among the eastern frontier pueblos of New Mexico and the inhabitants of the, South Plain, the Southern Plains. The emergence of large-scale economic change, exchange networks that connected the eastern frontier pueblos of New Mexico with the inhabitants of the Southern Plains rested upon the flourishing of corn, squash, and beans among the eastern frontier pueblos and the Caddoan speakers' dependence on deer, and especially bison, for their survival. Trade between the pueblos of Taos, Pecoris, Pecos, Calostea, Calosteo, and Gran Quevira, with traders from farther east, flourished during the protohistoric period between 1200 and 1450 AD. However, the environmental, demographic, social, and political conditions <coughs> changed in these two areas with the movement of the Southern Athapascans into the Southern Plains. They disrupted trade between the Pueblos and the Cados, and it led to the development of what archaeologists refer to as the Dismal River phase um, that, uh, is, that occurred sometime between 1400 and 1500 AD. So given the insights gained through careful consideration of Southern Athapascan migration and territorial expansion, Apachean cosmovision and cultural traditions, and Apachean lifeways and plains public exchange networks, it is possible to reinterpret many of the documents relating to Apachean history <coughs> in the Southwest colonial archives of the greater uh, New Mexico area. <clears throat> When the first Spanish explorers entered the scene in the mid-16th century, they were unaware of the large-scale migration of the Southern Athapascans from the north. Indeed, it was not until the mid-19th century that anthropologists began to reconstruct the history of their movement into the region. <clears throat> 
Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca was the earliest Spanish explorer to have passed through the region. He was originally appointed to accompany the expedition of Panfilo Narvez to Florida, but his itinerary changed when his vessel was destroyed by a hurricane and he became stranded on the Gulf Coast of Texas in November of 1528. While many other members of the expedition were lost at sea and never seen again, Cabeza de Vaca was rescued by a group of Karankawa Indians who provided him and his three companions with food and shelter. Cabeza de Vaca lived for six and a half years among the Karankawas of Texas, alternately assuming the role of a shaman who practiced healing ceremonies and the role of a captive or a slave who performed hard labor for his superiors. Cabeza de Vaca and his three companions eventually departed from the Gulf Coast and followed the Cohuitecan groups up the lower Rio Grande Valley, beyond the Conchos and the Pecos River into northern Sonora, where in 1833, they encountered Mayo Indians who were fleeing the slave raiding expeditions led by Francisco de Ibarra. When Cabeza de Vaca published his narrative of his travels in 1542, he stirred the imaginations of his contemporaries and fueled visions of new worlds and civilizations and other regions, uh, new worlds and civilizations on the scale of the Aztec the Mayan and the Incan empires that the Spanish conquistadors encountered in other regions within the Western Hemisphere. Indeed, the narrative was brought to the attention of the Viceroy of New Spain, Antonio de Mendoza, who ordered the immediate action be taken to secure the newly discovered lands for the crown. Mendoza commissioned the Franciscan, Fray Marcos de Niza, to explore the region, taking with him to Cabeza de Vaca's companion. Estabanico as a guide. After a tragic misunderstanding that led to Estabanico's death at the Zuni Pueblo, Fray Marcos de Niza returned to Central, America, Central Mexico later that year with extravagant tales of a place he called Cibola. Apparently inspired by the architecture of the Zuni Pueblo, de Niza claimed to have seen a city larger than Mexico City, whose houses were made of silver, gold, and turquoise. Despite Estebanico's death and the dubious provenance of Denitza's report, Mendoza authorized another, much larger expedition to explore the interior of the continent north of Mexico in the following year. Although Denitza's reputation was undermined when he returned to the Zuni Pueblo and was forced to admit that he had fabricated his description from whole cloth, the myth of the seven cities of Cibola inspired the colonial imagination of his contemporaries. For example, the Portuguese cartographer created this magnificent illustration of the seven cities of Sibula, rendered here in Latin, in his atlas published in 1578. Now this was an atlas that looked at all of the Portuguese conquests around the globe. And here is one particular detail uh, for, uh, in my eyes, one of the earliest depictions of the American Southwest from um, the 16th century. So, Following Denitza's expedition was the expedition of um, <clears throat> Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. In contrast with Denitza's account, the chronicler of uh, the Coronado expedition in, in 1540 would produce a much more sober and objective rendering of the environmental, cultural, social, and political conditions in the region. <clears throat> So Pedro de, Pedro, Pedro de Castaneda wrote in 1540 a description of, this is one of the first descriptions that we have of the Southern Plains macroeconomy, or the people that he identified as carecheros and teyas. Quote, these people follow the buffalo, hunting, hunting them and tanning the skins to take the settlements into the winter to sell, since they go there to pass the winter. Each company going to those which are nearest, some to the settlements at Cucuye, Pecos, and others towards Quivira, or Wichita, and others to the settlements which are situated in the direction of Florida. They described some large settlements, and judging from what was seen of these people and from the accounts they gave of other places, there are a good many more of these people than, than there are those at the settlements. So Castaneda's observations indicated the ancestral Apache were integrated within a broad network of settlements stretching from the Pecos Pueblo in eastern New Mexico to the Wichita villages in central Kansas, 
His ethnographic account suggested how their seasonal migrations from the Central Plains to locations further south brought them into regular contact with other Indian cultures as well as Spanish colonists. Although Spaniards would not establish a permanent presence on the upper Rio Grande until 1598, the location of the Plains Apache at the center of the Pecos and Wichita trading centers was a prescient sign of their powerful but liminal position at the edge of multiple worlds. The Carechos and Teas, the Casaneta observed in the Central Plains in the mid 16th century, represent, represented one of the many different Apache settlements, or rancherias, that modern anthropological research has linked to the Athapascan diaspora. The dispersed population of hunters and gatherers that he described were most likely associated with the archaeological remains at the Dismal River site in present-day Nebraska. The various sherds of pottery and other types of material culture at that site, at that site revealed the influence of Manda, Arakira, Pali, and Wichita cultures. Pottery recovered from sites further south bore the markings of pottery produced in Taos and Pecuri. Colonial authorities continue to observe the activities of these and other groups of Apache living along the edge of Spanish settlements in New Mexico during the 17th century. So, um, they developed a lexicon of indigenous ethnonyms that identified the different bands or clans with features of the geography they inhabited, distinct cultural characteristics, and the names of prominent leaders. Thus, the Apache inhabitants of the Southern Plains were known as the Llaneros, and those living near the Gila and Membros watersheds were referred to as Helenos and Membreños. Similarly, the Jicarillas were known for the production of small woven baskets, and the Mescaleros for their seasonal gathering of mescal root. Although some ethnonyms were more obscure, such as the Epandis for the Lapan Apache of Texas, Spanish authorities employed this lexicon consistently, modifying it as a colonial understanding of the indigenous geography changed over time. <clears throat> so this is a uh, 17th century map by Diego de Peñolosa, who was a former governor of New Mexico. And he, he fled to France in a, in a betrayal of his uh, father country uh, in an effort to sort of pawn off knowledge that he had about New Mexico. At that time, um, the French Empire was becoming increasingly interested in the settlements that were developing in the upper Rio Grande Valley. And I think um, this map is interesting to look at as a historical source um, uh, because it, it does make this uh, French uh, inquiry into the region so apparent as Le Nou Mexique um, in 1685, uh, which is right in the center of uh, the Pueblo Revolt in New Mexico. Um, but it also ha has on it a number of different Apache ethnonyms uh, that give insight into sort of the colonial understanding of this indigenous geography uh, that existed in the periphery of the, the central Puebloan settlements. So we see names such as over here on the left in the um, southwest, Apaches de Tarillo. We see Apaches de Gila, Apaches de Navajo. Apaches, Vaqueros, and various other um, uh, indigenous ethnonyms that evolved and changed over the course of the 17th and 18th century. So here's a representation uh, of how uh, French colonists perceived North America during the early 18th century. And uh, this map, I think, draws inspiration from uh, Diego de Peñolosa's map of New Mexico, as you can see here in, in, the, in the southwest corner. Um, and we see an extension of some of the ethnonyms that were in, in Peñolosa's map. And we see a recognition of a large uh, Apache homeland, the Pais de uh, des Apaches and des Palucas, um, uh, northeast of New Mexico in the southern Great Plains, in this region that I've been talking about. <clears throat> okay. So in the colonial period, the terms used for local groups, sometimes tribes, at others bands, and perhaps no more than large extended families 
increased as colonists gained greater familiarity with the neighboring peoples. This was especially true along the northern frontiers of New Mexico, where reports of Plains Indians armed with French manufactured guns and French traders traveling through the San Luis Valley to Taos signaled a new phase of imperial, imperial rivalry and competition. So this is uh, a document uh, from the Archivo General de la Nación from 1719. That is a large collection of correspondence um, sent from the Pueblo of Taos to the Center de Vice Royalty in the early 18th century. And it looks at um, the effect that some of the political changes happening in the Southern Plains had on uh, this particular group of Apache, the Hikaria Apache. Although the Hikaria Apache had developed extensive social and economic ties with the northern pueblos, especially at Taos, it was not until the early 18th century that Spanish authorities observed their presence in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. In the winter of 1719, Fray Juan de la Cruz wrote to, Vice, wrote to Viceroy Marquis de Valero, requesting permission to pursue the conversion of the Hikari Apache at the mission of San Jaramillo, located in the vicinity of Taos. In the following spring, New Mexico Governor Antonio Valverde de Pasio convened a meeting with several prominent mem members of the provincial government to discuss resettlement of the Hikari in the Sierra Blanca Apaches, then living in the area of Cuartalejo. So, Cortalejo is, is indicated on this uh, map up at, at the very top. It says, Les Cortacha and Les Cortatandes. Um, maybe that's not a perfect uh, translation of Cortalejo, but there was a, uh, a large Plains Apache settlement that was recognized as El Cortalejo, um, the distant settlement, or the, the, the distant place. Um, it was visited repeatedly uh, by the likes of uh, Juan de Urabari um, uh, during the early 18th century um, in an attempt to uh, negotiate diplomatic relations between the Spaniards and the Apaches of the Southern Great Plains. So given the paucity of water in the region, the severity of the winters, and the lack of building materials, the men in attendance determined that it would be most advantageous to move the various groups of Apaches to the Valle de Hicaria. Valverde de Casio reasoned that their close proximity to the Spanish settlement of Taos would facilitate their religious conversion and help to establish a buffer between the Spanish settlements there and the Utes, Comanches, Pawnees, and other nations allied with the French further to the northeast. As French colonists were said to have recently visited the residents in El Portalejo, the strategic benefits of an alliance between the Spanish and the Hicarias seem to have been the most uh, pertinent reason for their meeting. But the governor of New Mexico also enumerated the many additional advantage advantages to be gained through the resettlement. <clears throat> In response to the letter describing the situation, as well as several dispatches sent by the governor of the nearby province of Nuevo Vizcaya concerning the encroachment of the French the viceroy gathered his cabinet of advisors in the capital to discuss the gravity of the situation. They were sympathetic to the governor's proposal, and they noted the resettlement of the Apaches would not only serve a defensive purpose, quote, to impede the French against their ingress into New Mexico through their confederation with the Canises and the Caravachas, who both entered the Rio Grande by way of the Mississippi, but would also pr promote, quote, the union, peace, and confederation of the Apache Indians and secure a perpetual alliance. Even before notice of the viceroy's approval had reached Santa Fe, a violent encounter between the colonial militia and the French allied Pawnee Indians dramatically altered the course of an alliance between the Spanish colonists and the Hikari Apache then residing at El Portalejo. In a letter written to the Viceroy on October 8th, 1720, Valverde de Cosio described a botched attempt led by the Lieutenant General of the Santa Fe Presidio, Pedro de Villasur, to negotiate a treaty with the Pawnees. Earlier that summer, Villasur had departed from Santa Fe with 40 soldiers and several vecinos and Indian auxiliaries, and having traveled happily, arrived at the banks of the turbulent river that divides the nation of the Apache Cuartalejos, who are our allies from those allied with the French. There, at what was at the time recognized as a political boundary, 
Several of the Pawnees stepped forward to greet Villasua and his delegation. They had in their company a young Spanish captive who was to translate the terms of the agreement, while Villasua's interests were to be communicated through a Pawnee captive from Santa Fe who had been raised as a criado. When presented with a written agreement from his brethren, the Pawnee captive wrote a terse response on an old sheet of paper in a language that even the French could not understand. That letter was then delivered to the members of the Pawnee delegation, who returned in a short period of time with a flag bearing what Villasur's men believed to be a British insignia. This act prompted Villasur to produce a flag of their own, bearing the Spanish royal standard. As they had received only this ominous premonition, Villasur decided to write a second letter quote, with paper, ink, and cannons, so that one could understand its meaning, end quote. They delivered the second letter to the Pawnees and waited nervously for two days at the confluence of the Platte and the Loop Rivers in present-day Nebraska before being attacked by what was described as an infinity of Pawnee Indians. That melee left, that melee left Villasur and 44 of his men dead. This violent episode was illustrated by an unknown artist in a series of paintings known as the Segus or Hyde paintings. In this detail of the second painting in the series, we can see the ambush it was, as it was imagined by Villasur's contemporaries. This event marked a critical turning point in the history of the Jicarillas Apache of the Spanish. Pekka Heimelainen has argued that the Villasur catastrophe coupled with this peace between Spain and France and Europe later that year, made Spanish officials reluctant to invest men and money to help the Apaches who would appear to be no more than a lost cause. Ned Blackhawk has similarly concluded that the debacle halted all efforts to colonize the Apacheria. But there's evidence that the unambiguous defeat of the Spanish militia, in fact, accelerated the resettlement first proposed by Juan de la Cruz in the preceding winter. Now even more vulnerable to the growing hegemony of the empires, the people who had resided in El Cuartalejo made direct appeals to the civil and ecclesiastical officials who could provide shelter and a modicum of security. Determined to protect the, their communities from the onslaught of the Pawnees and even the more powerful indigenous nations further east, the leaders of the Jicare Apache decided to abandon their ancestral homelands on the southern plains in the early 1720s and move their families more than 50 miles west to a settlement near the Spanish mission in Pueblo of Taos. An analysis of the series of negotiation between Hikaria representatives and Spanish colonial officials in these years suggests that both parties considered mutual accommodation a superior alternative to the despairingly volatile conflicts they faced further east. <clears throat> the resettlement of the Jicarilla Apache in your house in the early 1720s marked the formal abandon abandonment of El Cuartalejo by the Apaches and the Spaniards alike. The archival record reveals the testimony of Jicarilla descendants confirmed the voluntary westward migration in this period that concluded the Apaches' historical occupation of that region. <clears throat> okay, so. In this section, I continue to describe some of the negotiation that proceeded um, after this uh, Villasur uh, massacre that we see depicted in the, the Seminar High painting. Um, this event marked a catastrophe for uh, the Spanish colonial authorities who had hoped to sort of extend uh, the, the dominions of Spain further north uh, into the San Luis Valley, into the southern plains, into this area known as La Jicaria or uh, Puerto Lejo. Um, but for the Hikaria Apache, it also marked a unique opportunity um, for accommodation and diplomacy um, with uh, the Spanish Empire. And uh, the correspondence from this period uh, really looks at great detail at some of the petitions and some of uh, the correspondence and the meetings uh, that occurred um, during this period of time. <clears throat> there were a variety of factors that simultaneously propelled and inhibited the Hikaria migration, including intertribal war warfare, kinship networks, settler colonialism, and the spread of infectious disease. However, the presidio that Spanish authorities promised would be built in 17 1723 was never brought to fruition. So as part of the resettlement process, um, the Hikaria also petitioned for a presidio to be established in, uh, in the Taos area. And a presidio was a colonial uh, defensive military garrison. And they anticipated 
that uh, such an institution would bring greater defense and greater resources um, to that part of, uh, of, of New Mexico. Um, unfortunately, at that same time period, um, there were uh, ongoing reforms within the Spanish Empire um, that were trying to uh, really reduce the budget and reduce the expenditures of um, the, the North American colonies. Um, so that presidio, along with many other presidios that had been proposed during the 18th century, early 18th century, um, was never brought uh, to fruition. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to transition from uh, discussing the Hikaria Apache, uh, whose homelands um, moved from the early 18th century from the Southern Plains to, the, uh, to northern New Mexico and to the Sangre de Crispo Mountains, um, to thinking about um, a different effect of the uh, uh, migration and territorial expansion of the Southern Athapascan diaspora uh, during the, uh, the early 18th century. <clears throat> As Plains and Hikaria Apache moved to new environments and territories where they could escape the violence emanating from the Pancharia, their distant relatives sought refuge along the fringes of Spanish settlements in Texas. The Laban Apache left their former homelands in the Southern Plains during the mid-18th century following the Colorado and Pecos rivers as they descended across the semi-arid western steppe known as the Llano Estacado. From there, they proceeded to the edge of the Edwards Plateau, where the jagged Balcones Escarpment separated the western desert shrub and grasslands from the verdant mesquite juniper oak savanna and the coastal plain. Although the Laban Apache had periodically traveled through and settled in Texas before the mid-18th century, their numbers increased dramatically in the 1750s, as Comanche aggressions forced them to flee their former hunting grounds. Spanish colonists drew them into the do domestic sphere as neophytes and slaves, and independent families pursued new alliances and econo economic opportunities at San Antonio de Bejar, Laredo, Monclova, and other settlements further south. So, the narrative that I'm going to proceed to tell is, is primarily centered at San Antonio de Bajar, um, which I'll point out here in this map. Um, but, but some of the earlier Spanish missions and some of the earlier uh, Spanish presidios were located closer to the Rio Grande River, which I'll also point out here. And this map of the tribal territories indicates uh, uh, the Bonapache homeland that terminates at the Rio Grande here. And um, uh, I think that um, this is. Uh, primarily because it focuses on a 19th century or 20th century interpretation of tribal homeland. Um, and as you'll see in, in, in the narrative that I present here, um, this uh, indigenous geography stretched much further south uh, through Cojuila, Nuevo León, and even into present day uh, Tamaulipas. <clears throat> Considering their relatively weak influence, it seems incongruous that so much of the historiography on Texas during the early 18th century has fixated on Spanish colonial institutions. Triumphalist narratives of heroic conquest have tended to overshadow the bitter reality of ethnic cleansing in Texas during both the 18th and the 19th centuries. Even historians who have explicitly set out to describe the demographic composition and social structures of communities in colonial Texas have relegated native groups such as the Apache to the margins. A close reading of the archival materials from the early 18th century reveals that many of the most significant events in the early history of Texas centered on the question of the Apache's structural position within colonial society. In this brief analysis, I examine both violent and nonviolent encounters between Spanish colonists and the Lapan Apaches in the province of Texas through the writings of Toribio de Arrutia, who served for 12 years between 1740 and 1762 as a captain of the Presidio of San Antonio in Baja. I seek to emphasize the cultural encounters between these two groups, the grounds on which they agreed with one another, and the common interests they shared. When Toribio de Urrutia began his career as a military officer, he entered into what could be described as a perpetual state of low-grade guerrilla warfare. Since the founding of the San Antonio Bajar Presidio in 1721, Apaches defiantly asserted their hegemony in the region greeting the first wave of settlers by planting a row of arrow shafts with red fla cloth flying from the tops outside the walls, which designated the Spaniards, which were designed to put Spaniards on notice that they resided along Apache 
So here's a, an early map showing the location of uh, the person here. <clears throat> I, I'm going to need a second to uh, catch my breath here, um, but in the, in the interim, um, I just like to uh, take a step back from this particular narrative and talk a little bit about some of the uh, the sources that I'm using. Uh, for this analysis. Um, this is a, a, a map that's held the John Carter Brown uh, Library uh, in Rhode Island. Um, and it, along with um, earlier, uh, early 18th century uh, cartography, really does sort of emphasize the lack of understanding that the Spaniards had of the physical environment surrounding um, these very isolated settlements. You know, through, through a map like this, we can understand that uh, the colonists who advanced into areas like uh, uh, southern Texas during this period had very uh, narrow paths to travel. Uh, they often did not explore into uh, uh, other environments or ecosystems, and as a result, their knowledge of the physical geography was, was, was very limited. So I think that's something um, that really uh, comes across clearly in, in this type of uh, cartography from the period. So, Arrutia, who was uh, the captain of the Presidio uh, San Antonio de Bajar, um, discussed um, in considerable detail uh, in the correspondence from this period the different uh, attempts at uh, uh, peace treaties, the different uh, forms of diplomacy um, that developed with the Apache and, and the